Okay, well, thanks very much, Richard, for the introduction, and thank, thank you all for coming. Um, when I was trying to think about how I was going to do this lecture, I originally thought I would give some kind of slide talk with lots of pretty pictures and not much actual mathematics. And as you can see, I decided not to do that. Uh, I decided that since I, I do mathematics, I'm going to actually do maths. Um, this may turn out to be a bad idea, but we will see. So I want to go back to, to ancient Greece and to, to Pythagoras to start with. So as, as hopefully many of you know, uh, Pythagoras' theorem uh, tells you that if you have a right-angled triangle, maybe like this, and the lengths of the sides are A, B, and C, uh, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So it's a very nice result, and uh, it has obviously got practical utility. Um, but what I care about more today, and in general, is, is, uh, is thinking about this more abstractly and thinking about sort of the possibilities for these the side lengths of these triangles, given this, this equation here. So maybe you remember from school there are examples like 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. So if I have a right angle triangle and this side has length 3 and this has length 4, then this has length 5. And there are lots of other nice examples like that, sort of 5 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared, and so on. And uh, I'll show you in a little bit how to generate sort of infinitely many nice examples like this. Now, the Greeks liked examples like this. They liked whole numbers. And they also liked fractions. So for example, if you take uh, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, and you divide through by 5 squared, you get uh, 3 squared over 5 squared plus 4 squared over 5 squared equals 1. Or if you like, that's the same thing as saying that 3 fifths squared plus four-fifths squared equals one. And this just says, this is just uh, a question about similar triangles. So if I take a triangle, uh, you, you might remember that two triangles are, are said to be similar if one is just made by rescaling the other. So maybe if I sort of shrink this one down to here, uh, this, triangle, this triangle here is similar to this triangle here. The angles are all the same. It's just that maybe in this example, all the sides are maybe twice as long or something. So all the sides get scaled by the same amount. So here, this is just saying that there's some right-angled triangle whose uh, side lengths are uh, 3 fifths, 4 fifths, and 1. So this was great. And the Pythagoreans uh, kind of explored this and wrote down lots of examples and so on. And then they had a nasty shock at some point when they realized that if they drew a very simple triangle, uh, one whose sides here were both of length 1. Well, we get 1 squared plus 1 squared. That's 1 plus 1, which is 2. So the side length of this one is the square root of 2. But then they discovered at some point that the square root of 2 is not a fraction. It's not a rational number. So you can't ever write it as a ratio of two whole numbers. Um, in terms of its decimal expansion, it's sort of 1.414 dot, 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 dot. And this decimal expansion doesn't ever stop, and it doesn't ever repeat either. It's just some so infinite string. And this was kind of horrifying, I think, to, to some Pythagoreans at least, because they didn't really think of quantities like this as numbers. They really thought of, of numbers as being, being these, these, these rational numbers, these ratios. So, so they wanted to find a way of finding all the examples of, of triangles, right-angled triangles, whose side lengths were all actually fractions, actually rational numbers. And then they considered various questions about them. And the question I want to talk about today I'll start putting up over here, is what's called the uh, congruent number problem. I mean, I don't think this is what it was called by the Greeks. I don't know. I did do some historical reading this, this week and didn't kind of work out exactly when this, this terminology came in. But the question is, uh, what are the possible areas Possible, sorry, uh, yeah, possible areas of right angled triangles with rational sides. So 
with all the side lengths being rational numbers. So for example, if I take my, well, before I go too far, I should tell you how to work out the area of a triangle. Let's, oops, let's just look at this triangle I conveniently have up here. That's maybe, a, maybe I shouldn't erase Pythagoras theorem. But. So if I want to work out the area of this right angled triangle, it's particularly simple, as you may well remember. What you do is you put another copy of the triangle up here, then you have a rectangle. The area of the rectangle is just the product of the two sides, a times b. So the area of the, the triangle is a half a times b. So my uh, 3, 4, 5, maybe I'll just write 3, 4, 5 for the side lengths of that triangle. Um, I do have to do a half of 3 times 4. So a half times 3 times 4, which is 6. So 6 is an example of what they were calling a congruent number. And similarly, if I take maybe the 5, 12, 13 example, uh, I do a half times 5 times 12, which is probably 30. And I guess I had another example. I have my 3 fifths, 4 fifths, 1 example. And I do a half times 3 fifths times 4 fifths, which I guess is 6 20 fifths. Of course, this triangle here is just, sorry, this, tri this triangle here, this 3 fifths, 4 fifths, 1, was just this shrunk by a factor of 5. And when you shrink all the sides by a factor of 5, the area goes down by a factor of 25, so that wasn't so surprising. OK, so they wanted to know exactly which numbers you could, you could find as areas like this. And I think there were already some suspicions back then that it, the answer wasn't all rational numbers. And in particular, the, the case I want to focus on is, uh, is 1 a congruent number. A congruent number is one of these. Sorry, it's the area of a triangle with rational sides. Thank you. I forgot what I've been saying. So that says, is there a right-angled triangle, all of whose side lengths are rational numbers, are fractions, and whose area is 1? OK, so maybe that doesn't sound so interesting, but it was very interesting to, to the Greeks and, and to a lot of people afterwards. And I'll hopefully show you how this actually leads to some, some very interesting uh, problems in maths. So, OK, so let's see how we could try and solve that. So I can, I'll show you some steps that I think were certainly known to the Greeks. Although I don't, as far as I can tell, this problem wasn't solved until the 17th century, in fact. Well, the question of whether one is a congruent number wasn't solved. I should say the, the, the general question is in some sense still open. The question of actually having an algorithm. So if you give me a, uh, a rational number and ask if it's the area of one of these right angle triangles, having an actual algorithm for doing that is still actually open. In, it's open in the sense that I can't, no one can prove that there's an algorithm. There is an algorithm that's known and that everyone believes works. But in fact, there's no, it's still rather mysterious uh, why it works. OK, well, I'm skipping ahead slightly. So let's go back to, uh, to this equation, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And let's see how the Greeks were able to, ge to generate things like 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5 squared. So the first thing they did was something I already did with the 3, 4, 5 example. They did some rescaling. So they divided by this c squared. So you get a, set, a squared over c squared plus b squared over c squared is 1. And that's the same as saying that a over c all squared plus b over c squared equals 1. And then what we can do is we can introduce a little relabeling. Let's write x for a over c and y for b over c. And then when we do that, this equation just becomes x squared plus y squared equals 1. And certainly, if a, b, and c were rational numbers with fractions, then the same thing is going to be true for a over c and b over c as well. So really, what we want to do now is we want to find the pairs of rational numbers, the, the pairs of, of fractions where uh, x and y, where x squared plus y squared equals 1. OK, so, so the nice thing that the Greeks did with this, or, and it certainly was... Uh, was done an awful lot later on, particularly by people like Descartes, who we named Cartesian coordinates after, 
was to draw pictures of this. So whenever you have some equation with just two letters, x and y, you can draw the graph of the solutions. So let me kind of remind you how that goes. So we have an x-axis and a y-axis. And what we can do is just plot all the solutions to this equation and just draw the picture. And the answer, as I'll explain to you in a moment, is a nice picture. It's a circle. Imagine that's actually a circle. And so this point here, so you usually write coordinates in the form x, y. So this is the point 1, 0. This is the point 0, 1. This is the point minus 1, 0, and so on. Up here somewhere is sort of half square root 2, half square root 2, and things like that. So why is it a circle? Well, let's just think about what it means to be a point x, y on here. Well, if I draw this right angle triangle here, just by definition, the way that coordinates work is you do the x distance across and the y distance up. So this distance across here is just x. And then this distance up here is y. And then I've said that x squared plus y squared equals 1. And so Pythagoras theorem tells me that this length here is 1. So all the points are exactly the points on this circle of radius 1. So the question you can then rephrase as being, draw the circle of radius 1. What are all the points on it such that both the coordinates are rational numbers? So it's perhaps not immediately obvious. In fact, it's certainly not immediately obvious that we've actually improved our situation by having this picture. But it turns out that there's something nice you can now do, uh, which gives you a very nice way to find all the solutions. So let me just draw my circle again. So the idea is the following. So let's take our circle. Let's choose one particular point which has rational coordinates. And let's uh, just make it this one, this point minus 1, 0. So here's some point on the circle with rational coordinates. And let's suppose we have another point over here. And let's suppose that that has rational coordinates as well. If I'd drawn things in a slightly different scale, maybe this would be like, maybe this could be sort of 5 thirteenths, 12 thirteenths or something. And what you can do is draw this line through here. And the nice thing about drawing a line through a circle is it meets it in exactly two points. So this, this line through here unambiguously determines this point here, and conversely, this point determines this line. OK, so this, this circle had equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. The next thing I want to do is work out what the equation of this line is. And I can't literally do that at the moment, because I haven't told you. I mean, there are infinitely many lines through here. I can sort of rotate around. But let's just sort of write down the general equation for a line through this point. So what does it look like? Well, if you cast your mind back to GCSEs or O levels or something, that you might remember that the equations of lines look like this. They're sort of linear things. Y is some number times x plus some other number. So if you wanted to, you could kind of use that, that kind of expression to try and work out equations for this line. I think it's better to remember where this idea comes from, where this equation comes from. And the place it comes from is, let's just think about, let's kind of forget that we're trying to, uh, maybe let's literally forget that we've got the circle and let me have just a line through that point because it comes down to something about similar triangles that I was saying earlier. So so I've got my x, y coordinates. I've got this point minus 1, 0. And I have a line going up like this. And let's just consider a point x, y on this line. And maybe consider a different, how I could have chosen a different one down here. Now, if I if I draw these triangles here, so if I just draw these right angle triangles, then this triangle here is a similar triangle to this triangle here. I just get it by rescaling. The angles are the same. And what that means is the ratios of the sides in this triangle, the ratio, for example, of this over this, is the same as the ratio of this over this. And this distance here is y. And we can work out what this distance here is because well, it's not quite x, because x is this distance here. 
But this distance here is just one. This is just this point minus one, zero. So this distance here is one. And so this total distance here is x, is, sorry, x plus one. So what this observation about the similar triangle says is that this ratio, y divided by x plus one, doesn't change as I move along the line. So if I give it another name, let's just introduce some letter to be, uh, to be the name of this constant ratio, then this is the equation of a line. And that maybe doesn't look quite what I've written over there, this y equals mx plus c, but if I multiply by x plus 1, I get y is t times x plus 1, which is just tx plus t, if you like. So the point is that t here is just some particular choice of number. The t is telling you the slope of this line. And different choices of t give you different lines. And if you want to find the, the line for a particular, if I give you a particular line and I just give you a point on it, then you just work out what y over x plus 1 is, and that tells you what this t is. OK, so this line I'm going to say is y is t times x plus 1. OK, and again, if, I, if my coordinates x and y were rational numbers, then so is this, this number t. It's going to be important in a little bit. OK, so, so suppose now I just tell you some particular value of t. That tells you what this line is. It tells you the slope of this line. You know it goes through this point. So it's determined the line. So it's determined this point of intersection. We must be able to work out what that is. And it's going to be found by solving these two equations at the same time. We've got x squared plus y squared equals 1. And we've got y is t times x plus 1. So what we have to do is solve those equations together. So let's try and do that. I'm afraid I'm going to erase my pretty triangle. And I'm afraid I'm going to do a bit of algebra for a couple of minutes. And if you don't like algebra, then you might want to turn away now. Um, but once I've done it, I'll come back to something slightly more concrete again, perhaps. OK, so let me, let me write these uh, equations down. Sorry, y is t times x plus 1. And x squared plus y squared equals 1. So a natural thing to do is to take this, this second equation and just substitute in the first equation. Because like, this tells me an expression for y. If I just put this into here, I'll have got rid of y altogether. So that tells me that x squared plus t times x plus 1 squared equals 1. OK, so now I need to sort of multiply this out. And if I do that, I get t squared times x plus 1 squared equals 1. And I was told by an audience member who's not a mathematician earlier that this is GCSE mathematics to, to do this. So, so hopefully this is, uh, this is not so bad. And now I can group together all the terms. And I get 1 plus t squared x squared plus 2 t squared x plus t squared um, equals 1. And in fact, it's, better, it's nicer to sort of have something equal to 0. So I'm going to take off 1 from each side. I'll put minus 1 equals 0. OK, so we're getting somewhere. What I want to do is, remember, I want to try and find my point, my coordinates x and y, in terms of this t. So I've got an equation for x at the moment. Um, I prefer not to have things floating around on the outside. So let me divide everything through by that, that 1 plus t squared, which is fairly harmless, and I end up with this expression. Uh, here I'll have t squared minus 1 over t squared plus 1 equals 0. OK, so this now is the equation I want to solve. So this will tell me x, and once I have x, I can get y by just substituting back into one of these top equations. Now. If I gave you a particular value of t, if I just said, let's take t as 1 or something, then this would just be a quadratic equation of the kind that you may have seen at some, some point in the past. And there's a quadratic formula that would let you solve them. And if you look that up on Wikipedia or something, you'll see it's this, this thing with sort of minus, I can't even remember it. So uh, it's got a square root of b squared minus 4ac. <laughs> and I'm blanking a little on what it is, which is a good sign, because I don't want to use it. So, um, so it's kind of unpleasant, because you don't really want to square this and subtract off 4 times this or something. Uh, so what do we want to do? Well, 
it's a quadratic equation. That means it's got two solutions. So we're going to find two values of x. And that's a bit weird um, because we're only supposed to be finding one value. But the point is this line meet, does meet the circle in two points. There's also this point over here that we already knew about. Okay? And so this point really does lie on both the line and the circle. And so it's giving us a solution to this equation. And that solution is, is x equals minus 1. And indeed, if you put minus 1 in, you'll find that this works out to be 0. And what that means is you can actually factorize this thing. It must factorize. And one term is going to be x plus 1. And the other is going to be x plus something else. And you can just work out what that something else is by staring at one of these coefficients. It's going to have to be just this, if you like. You can either look at the sum or the product. So you get this equation. And I don't want this. This is, the, this is the solution x equals minus 1, which is the point we already knew about, which is kind of boring. So we want this thing here. And so this thing says that x is minus this, which is 1 minus t squared over t squared plus 1. And then we can work out what y is. y is t times x plus 1, which is t times 1 minus t squared over t squared plus 1 plus 1. And that is uh, t times, if you put this over a common denominator, you get 2 over t squared plus 1. So it's 2t over t squared plus 1. OK, so let me write that up here. OK, and now what this has done is that this has now given us a completely general formula to, to find every point on here on this circle with rational coordinates. You just choose rational numbers t, plug them in, plug it into this formula, and out comes a point. And every point corresponds to one choice. So let me, uh, I want to stay on this board. I'm going to write sort of all over the place, but let's just maybe just do an example so you can see that something does come out of this. If you take t is 2, I get x is 1 minus 4 divided by 1 plus 4, and y is uh, 2 times 2 is 4 divided by 1 plus 4. So this is x is minus 3 fifths, and y is 4 fifths. And what this is saying is that minus 3 fifths squared plus 4 fifths squared equals 1, which was up to a minus sign, which is pretty harmless, is what the first example I showed you. And if you choose sort of more interesting values of t, so you choose them like a tenth or three eighths or something, you'll get more and more interesting things coming out. OK. So, so maybe at this point we should go back to what the actual original question was. So I've sort of journeyed. So this is some nice, some nice thing you can now just play around with if you like. You can find this 5 squared plus 12 squared is 13 squared and so on. And, sort of see how all of those come out. But what we actually wanted to do was to try and find a, a right-angled triangle, all of whose side lengths were rational numbers, and whose area was 1. So what we wanted to solve was the equations that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and then we wanted the area of the triangle, half time of a times b, to be 1. OK? And what I've given you now is a formula for x and y in terms of this t. And x was a divided by c, and y was b divided by c. So let's go back and see what this tells us about a, b, and c. So this, if I just multiply each side by c, I get that a is c x, c times x, and b is c times y. OK. So then a half of a times b is c x times c y which is c squared x times y. And now I have to substitute that. Uh, oh, sorry, I've lost a half probably somewhere. I was thinking I, that got a little too simple. OK, we'll see that half disappear in just a moment. So a half of c squared xy is a half of c squared times, well, x is this 1 minus t squared over t squared plus 1, and y is 2t over t squared plus 1. 
first thing I want to do is cancel the half and the two, which I'd now already done over there, but mistakenly for a moment. Now, I've got two copies of t squared plus one, so that's, I can make that sort of squared. So this is c squared over t squared plus one squared times one minus t squared times t. OK. So this is starting to look pretty messy, most likely, but let's, let's kind of soldier on. What did I want to do? I wanted to make this quantity equal to 1. OK? So the equation I really want to solve now is this equation, 1 equals this thing, OK? Which probably looks pretty horrible. But let me, uh, let me make it look a little less horrible, hopefully. Let me multiply each side by sort of the, the opposite of this. So multiply by t squared plus 1 squared divided by c squared. I get t squared plus 1 uh, squared over c squared equals 1 minus t squared times t is what I want to solve. And so I might just write down here for one moment. Uh, that is now going to be t squared plus 1 over c squared is, I can multiply this thing out, is t minus t cubed. And now I'm going to do another bit of relabeling. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write y, capital Y now, I'm going to define to be t squared plus 1 over c. And I'm going to let x, capital X, be minus t. OK? And let's see why that might be a nice thing to do. Well, the left-hand side of this equation now is just y squared. OK? So this is y squared. And the right-hand side is not quite sort of x minus x cubed. But the point is, if I do this, then t equals minus x. And then t minus t cubed is sort of minus x minus minus x cubed. And if you get around the headache of how many minus signs I've got, that comes out to be x cubed minus x. So this, becomes, this equation then becomes this thing here. y squared is x cubed minus x, which hopefully looks a little more pleasant than the, the thing I had up here. And the important thing is that I mean, you might just wonder why on earth I'm allowed to go around kind of just relabeling things in this arbitrary-looking way. But the point is, let's, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find solutions to equations. So if we had a solution to our original a, b, and c, then we had a way of getting this x and this y, little x and little y, getting the t out of that, and then following this all through, and we could get a capital Y and a capital X. And what you'll see is that those, are all, those turn out to be rational numbers when I do that. Because all I'm ever doing is sort of squaring things, adding, dividing. That doesn't change being a fraction. So if I had a, uh, a solution to start with, then I would be able to get a nice solution to this equation, a solution with rational numbers. And now, and now, the, kind of, so now the question is basically, does this, does this have rational solutions? And then there's now one slight blip, which is that I just said I can kind of run all this forwards and get this solution. You then have to worry slightly about whether I can run it all backwards. Because let me show you a solution to this. There's a solution that x equals y equals 0. OK? Because 0 squared is 0. 0 cubed is 0. Minus 0 is 0. So each side is 0. So this is great. This is a solution. So now let's see what our triangle looks like. Well, unfortunately, we now get that, uh, that t is 0 from this equation. And now this equation tells us that y, which is 0, equals t squared plus 1 is 0 plus 1 divided by c. And now that's bad, because c was supposed to be the length of the hypotenuse of our triangle. And, uh, and now I've got 0 equals 1 divided by c, and c is suddenly some infinite thing. And this is a bit of a disaster. OK, so that's not so good. But in fact, that was the only problem. The only problem was basically that I divided by 0 at some point. If I, if I tried to run things backwards, I would divide by y at some point. And so what I want, let me write it over here. And hopefully I'm now writing it at a more sensible level where you can all see. But you can kind of forget all the algebra now, if you like, and just focus on the the equation I came out with there at the end, because that's not really forgetting algebra completely, but you can forget all the, 
the manipulations I just did. So the equation I came down to is y squared is x cubed minus x. And the question is, does this have any solutions where x and y are rational numbers and y is not 0? OK, so this is a question that was studied in, in ancient Greece and various other ancient societies, but wasn't solved, as far as I can tell, until uh, Fermat solved it in the 17th century. So probably many of you know the story of Fermat's Last Theorem, where he had this copy of Diophantus, uh, another ancient Greek author's book on, on solving equations in rational numbers, and he put various marginal comments, including this famous claim to prove Fermat's Last Theorem. Uh, which he almost certainly hadn't done. But on the other hand, he did, in a different page, put a marginal comment which explained how to solve this equation, how to find all the rational solutions. And so Fermat showed, and if we had sort of another hour or so, I would show you now, but I'm certainly not going to, that the only solutions to this in uh, rational numbers are those with uh, with y equals 0. So when y equals 0, there are actually three solutions. You can take x to be 0 or 1 or negative 1. Those all give you solutions. And so the, the consequence of that is that 1 is not a congruent number. In other words, there are no right-angled triangles with rational sides whose area is 1, which is this question that had been raised sort of 2,000 years previously. OK, well, luckily that's not the end of the story. Well, luckily for me, maybe not so luckily <laughs> for you guys. Um, so now I, I've talked for sort of 25 minutes and not said anything about elliptic curves. And now I should say this is an example of an elliptic curve. In some sense, it's a typical example. In other senses, I'll get to later, it's not a very typical example. But elliptic curves, in general, are equations that look like y squared is some cubic expression in x. So this is a cubic expression. The highest degree term is x cubed. And you can draw a picture of it, and it looks very roughly something like, uh, like this. Uh, very roughly like this. So you can check that if x is between 0 and 1, then x cubed minus x is negative, and so can't be a square. And there's some nice symmetry here. Basically, whenever you have a point down here, its mirror image up here is also a point. And that's just because y squared is minus y squared. OK? So, so one thing you might wonder, and I think people like Fermat did wonder, is whether you could, this isn't really a circle, by the way. This is just me not being able to draw a round thing that isn't a circle. But. Um, you might be guided by the sort of similar picture here. You might wonder whether I could apply the same procedure that we applied with the circle to find rational points on this curve. So maybe we could start with this point that we already know, and then we could draw a line through it and see if we get more points. And there's one basic problem, which is that if you draw a line and see where it crosses this curve, unfortunately, it always crosses it in three points. And that's basically because if you substitute in, we had some equation before where y was a multiple of x, more or less, you substitute in, now you get a cubic equation for x, and it has three solutions. And then the problem is that when we had before, you can, all, you can still get some simplification. You can still take out some factor of x plus 1 from this point. But then you get left with a quadratic equation now for x. And there's no reason at all that the roots will be rational numbers. Okay? Typically, when you apply the quadratic formula that I couldn't remember earlier, uh, you'll find square roots coming out. And so you'll get two points over here, and neither of them will actually have rational numbers. They involve things like square root of 2, or more typically sort of square root of 179, or some random-looking number. So, and that's good in some sense, because otherwise Fermat would have been completely wrong, because he's told us that the only rational points are these three along here. OK, so that might make you wonder if the geometry is kind of useless here, because we no longer have some nice way of taking a line and getting a new point. But in fact, what people realized was that you could still make a lot of use of this. And what use can you make? Well, let me draw another 
another picture. So, okay, so let me just draw that same kind of picture again, maybe without even having the axes. Let's just imagine I have two points, P and Q, say. Well, what I can do is then if the, I had two points with rational coordinates and draw a line through them, there's now a unique line through them, and I get a unique third point. Okay? And it turns out to be easy to check that if I took two points that had rational coordinates and did this, the third point would also have rational coordinates. Now, of course, if we go to the actual fact that Fermat told us, that's not so helpful because my three points have to be two of these three, and then, of course, the third point is just the same one. But if you're doing more general equations, and in fact, if you're Fermat trying to analyze this equation and, and determine this, this is a good procedure. So you just take, take your elliptic curve, imagine you have two different points with rational coordinates, and draw a line and get a third one. And then you can kind of carry this game on, if you like. You can now, well, given a point down here, by symmetry, there's a point up here, just drawing a vertical line intersecting it. And now I could draw the line through, through sort of these two and get a point down here. Maybe I can carry on. And you can kind of imagine getting lots and lots of points in this way. And indeed, quite often, that turns out to be the case. OK, so that's some fun game. And what Fermat did was somehow analyze how this would work. Very roughly, what he did was kind of assumed that there were other rational points and showed that if he played this game of drawing lines and also drawing tangents, uh, then he would be able to just get more and more points. And these points would become, in some sense, smaller and smaller, their coordinates would become simpler and simpler, and then they would have to somehow turn into one of these points, and then he was able to conclude that this is where he'd started. That was probably completely incomprehensible, but, uh, but it was, it's a relatively short argument, I, say. I could explain in sort of half an hour, an hour, but I'm not going to. What I'm going to do instead is explain another question that we can now ask uh, about this same curve. And very, very briefly, I'm going to tell you one, one reason we might do this. So I, I have almost no time to talk about this, but it turns out that in cryptography, elliptic curves have a, a very nice use, or several nice uses. And one use is it's often important uh, when you're doing codes to be able to generate random numbers, or not quite random numbers. Computers can't really generate random numbers, but numbers that look random. And it turns out, slightly surprisingly, one nice way to do that is to take an elliptic curve, take two points on it, and start playing this game of just drawing lines through and getting more points. And you can kind of imagine this picture was already looking a bit complicated. And it's, it's not a random process. Nothing that computers would be doing would be a completely random process. But in practice, it kind of bounces around a lot, and it behaves in a fairly random fashion. So that's something that computers actually do. One source of, of pseudo-random numbers, they're called, is, is playing a game very much like that with a curve, just taking two points taking a third one, bouncing around in this way. Now, the problem is that computers don't like, they, hardly, they don't really like rational numbers, fractions, because the fractions can get very big and they, the decimal expansions could go, go on and on and on. That's not so good. What's even worse is if you choose a curve like this, I already said, you don't even have many, many points with rational coordinates at all. So in general, the coordinates of points on here are going to involve sort of horrible square roots and things, and computers can't keep track of those. You want your computer to be doing something exact but it can only sort of work with decimals with a certain length or something. So that sounds bad, but what, uh, what the computers do instead is they do what's called uh, thinking about elliptic curves. Uh, modulo primes. And that's, so that's something that has a real practical importance that, unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you any more about than what I just said. But I'm going to explain what this means in a moment. But the, it also has a theoretical importance, which is what is of interest to me. So I have to just briefly tell you what this means. This, is, this here is, is what's called modular arithmetic. That's what I'm talking about. Or it's also sometimes called uh, clock arithmetic. And if that clock wasn't so hidden, I would use it as a slight prop. But let's imagine we can all see that clock completely to, to say what I mean. So what's clock arithmetic? Well, OK, let's imagine it's, uh, it's maybe like 9 o'clock. So imagine that I'm still talking in three hours' time. And then imagine that I announce I'm going to talk for another six hours. <laughs> and so you might immediately, you'll probably immediately think, what time is this going to finish? And you'll almost immediately get to the answer of 3 AM. And so 
how did you do that? Well, so it was kind of 9 p.m., and then you added six hours, and then you somehow got 3 a.m. out of it. OK? Well, what you've done is you've just started at 9 o'clock and gone round six hours, and when you get past 12, it resets again the clock. So really what you've done is 9 plus 6 is 15, but in fact, we're saying that equals 3, because what, we, what we're doing is we're ignoring the 12s. We just take the remainder of any number that's bigger than 12. Okay? So that's what clock arithmetic is. And I should say the one slightly strange thing is we do some, in, in mathematics when we do this, we don't sort of think of 12 o'clock as being 12, we think of 12 o'clock as being 0, more like sort of a 24-hour clock. OK, so that's addition. That makes sense. Turns out you can also multiply. It doesn't make so much sense to think about multiplying times on a clock, but you can still do it. So I could multiply on a clock, and I could do sort of, for example, that 3 times 7, if I liked, would be 21. But now I'm playing this game where I'm only allowed numbers from sort of 0 up to 11. So this is 9. OK? And I can just carry on doing that. Now, the slightly scary thing about doing this with, with my usual clock with 12 hands is that, for example, 3 times 4 is 12, which is 0. And that turns out to be a bad idea. I mean, it's slightly psychologically a bad idea to be taking two things and which aren't 0 and multiplying them and getting 0 coming out. And it turns out to mathematically not such a good idea either. And so computers don't like to do that. Well, maybe computers don't care, but maybe computer programmers care a bit more. And uh, <laughs> shouldn't really ascribe complex motivations to computers. But, um, but anyway, so what's the problem here? The problem is that 12... I could just factorize it as 3 times 4, OK? So what we can imagine now is that we're on some other planet where there are a different number of hours in the day, maybe, say, 7 hours or 11 hours or something, and then this problem wouldn't happen. So if I had 7 hours instead of 12, you can't factorize 7, OK? You can't write it as a product of two smaller numbers. So I'd never have this scary thing of multiplying two numbers and getting 0. And what's going on there is that 7 is a prime number. Prime numbers, by definition, are the ones that don't factorize, OK? So rather than working with a 12-hour clock, computers for this purpose want to work with a, with a clock with a prime number of hands. In fact, probably a prime number with sort of, you know, 80 digits or something. I'm not a absolutely humongous prime number, but for my purposes, just one of, I'm just going to sort of think about these small prime numbers for a minute. Uh, here's the first few, and so on. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose a prime number, and we're going to do all our arithmetic, all of this kind of, Geometric game, if you like, but, but we're going to only work modular that number, so we're only going to look at remainders with that number. So that's kind of hard to draw pictures of, but as I probably scared you all with earlier, you can turn these pictures into algebra, and the equations make perfect sense. So let's, let's see what happens. Let's choose a prime number, and I'm hopefully choose, going to choose a prime number that's small enough that I can actually calculate within a couple of minutes, and big enough to show you something somewhat interesting. So let's take our curve here, and let's count the number of points on it if I work. Uh, maybe let's do 11. So let's do this modulo 11. So it's almost like a clock, except somehow I threw away, I stretched things around, and there's only 11 possibilities rather than 12. OK, so the numbers modulo 11 are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. OK, let's try that again, because I really want to write them in one column. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then 11 is 0 again. So this is as far as I go. So now the first column, because I started to slide too high now, I'm going to label the first column down here. The first column, I'm going to take these numbers, and I'm going to square them and write down what I get. So 0 squared is 0. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. And now 4 squared is 16, but 16 isn't on my list. I have to take remainder with 11, so I get 5. Similarly, 5 squared is 25, and that's 22 plus 3, so I get a 3. Uh, 6 squared is 36, which is uh, 33 plus 3, and I get a 3. And if I just carry on, I get this. OK. So... For example, 10 squared is 100, which is 1 more than 99, and that's why I got a 1. So now I can do the same thing with my slightly more complicated thing. I could do these numbers and do this x cubed minus x business. 
And then what I'm going to do to work out all the solutions, I'm going to kind of look when I find a number in this column and in this column. That's what I'm going to do in a minute. So if I put in 0, 0 cubed is 0. Subtract 0, I get 0 again. Similarly, 1 cubed minus 1 is 0. Now, 2 cubed minus 2 is 8 minus 2 is 6. Uh, 3 cubed minus 3 is 27 minus 3, 24, which is 2 more than 22. Uh, 4 cubed minus 4 is 64 minus 4 is 60. So I guess that's 5. Do correct me if I make a mistake at some point. 5 cubed minus 5 is 125. Uh, minus 5 is 120, which is 1 less than 121, so I guess that's 10. And now I think the remaining numbers look something like this, if I'm not disastrously mistaken. And I'll explain in a minute how I was able to, to give those. OK, so let's now just try and, and see, see what values of x and y I can choose. So, so let's look at this. This is kind of my x column, if you like. So let's take if x is 0, this thing here is 0, and I just get this possibility here. So this is x is 0, y is 0. Similarly here, take x is 1, I get 0, and I'm forced to have 0 over here. So I have x is 1, y is 0. Now here, I get a 6. I look in this column, and there aren't any 6s. So this one is no good, OK? Uh, maybe I'm going to try and put a across through this one. OK, now I have 2. And again, it doesn't appear over here, so nothing doing. And now here I have 5. So I get x is 4. And now I could take y to be either 4, giving me that solution. Or it's also down here. So I get 7 as well. OK, here I've got 10. Doesn't appear over here. That's bad. OK. Now I've got 1, which appears both here and here. So I have x is 6, and y is 1 or 10. Here, 6. Again, not in this column, with no, no dice there. Uh, 8. Well, I've got a 9 over here, and 9 is appearing twice. So I've got x is 8, y is uh, 3 or 8. And here, 5 does appear at the 4 and the 7. So x is 9, y is 4 or 7. And finally, x uh, here is 10. I get 0 again. So y equals 0. And I can just count the number of possibilities. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I get 11 points. OK. So when I work modulo 11 using this equation, it turns out there are 11 solutions. OK, great. So now I'm not going to attempt to do more calculations like that in real time, but I'm going to write down a little table of them and show you what comes out of it. So what, what you can now do is you can just choose whichever prime numbers you like and play the same game and count the points. Obviously, it gets pretty tedious if you try and do it yourself if, if it's much bigger than 11. But on the other hand, computers can do this effectively instantly. And you get the following table of numbers for the first few primes. Uh, which I really don't have in my head. So the prime numbers are going to be 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, uh, 37, 41, 43, and so on. Hopefully I didn't miss any out. And the numbers I get out are 2, 3, uh, 7, 7, 9, 11, apparently 7 again, uh, 19, 23, Oh, sorry, I've got 17. Yeah, that was a 19. That was a 19 as well. 19, 23, uh, 39 at 29, 31, 39, uh, 51, and 43. Okay, hopefully those are correct. 
And I want to draw your attention to something. There are lots and lots of primes where the number that comes out is, uh, is just the prime number itself again. So there are these ones. 11, 19, 23, not 29, 31, not 37, but uh, not 41, but 43 again. And in fact, 47 would have given me 47 as well. So there's some pattern here. So, well, some, some kind of startup pattern. A lot of the times you get the prime number itself coming out again. And if you stare at what, which prime numbers it is, you have two, and then you have the sequence 3, 7, 11, 19, 23, 31, 43, and so on. And it turns out that those numbers are exactly the prime numbers, which are 3 modulo 4. OK, so if I take a number on this list, like 19, that's 16 plus 3. OK, 3 more than a multiple of 4. On the hand, a number that's not on it, 17 is 1 more than a multiple of 4. And that pattern just carries on forever, basically. So, so the kind of curious fact is that when I take a prime that is 3 more than a multiple of 4, I always get the number of solutions to this equation is exactly that prime number. And I'm going to very, very quickly kind of tell you how you see this. What's happened? There's a symmetry in this table. These were squares. There's a symmetry above and below this line. The numbers are the same. And the reason is that these numbers are just minus these numbers. 8 plus 3 is 0 in this world, because 8 plus 3 is 11, which is 0. And if I have a number and I take its, its negative and square them, I get the same thing. On the other hand, the reason I was able to write these numbers down quite quickly is these numbers down here are the negatives of these numbers. OK? So 10 plus 1 is 11, 6 plus 5 is 11, and so on. And the reason that is is that when I, I already saw this, when I do kind of minus x cubed minus minus x, you get minus x cubed minus x. So you get a, a sort of negative thing going on. And then the point is, if you look at the entries above and below, the pattern you find is that you either have two solutions on one side and none on the other, or two solutions up here and none down here. And that's the way it goes. And so half the time you get two solutions, and half the time you get no solutions. And the reason that's going on is what's happening is that the key fact is that minus 1, or 10, is not a square on this list. And that turns out to be the case exactly when the prime is 3 modulo 4. That's called the first supplement to Gauss's law of quadratic reciprocity, which is some nice fact. That sounds kind of very complicated and scary, but it's actually something you can do with sort of first-year undergraduate mathematics. So you can really prove this. OK, but now you might wonder about, if you're a mathematician at least, you might wonder, what about all the other numbers here? So they seem to be kind of all over the place. So at 13, we had 7, which is a lot less than 13. 29, we had 39, which is a lot more than 29. So sometimes it seems to be a lot smaller than p, sometimes a lot bigger. You might kind of randomly guess, by the way, that it was about p, because you might guess that sort of half the time when you did this, you got a square and got two values of y, and half the time you got none. So roughly speaking, you might have guessed that you got p got the same number as got the prime number, but clearly it can vary a lot. So then it turns out that Gauss in the 19th century was able to prove that these numbers over here could vary from the prime number, but not too much. So what he showed is that if this prime number is p and this number is n, then n is between p plus 2 square root of p and uh, p minus two, two, uh, twice the square root of p. So if you kind of plug this in, the, the error term here is 10, and that's just slightly smaller than twice the square root of 29, which is a little bit bigger than 10. OK, and that suggested to people uh, a long time later, maybe in the 1940s or so, that you could renormalize things. So you take n minus p and divide it by 2 root p. This says that these numbers should look like this. They, they're between minus 1 and 1. And now what you could do is just choose different prime numbers, a huge, huge list of them, and plot what these numbers are on a graph and see what they are. So at all of these ones where you're 3 more than a multiple of 4, this number is 0, because this number n was just the same as p. So half the time, you get a big fat spike at 0. And then it turns out, uh, slightly surprisingly at least to me, that you then, the rest of the time, you have something doing something like this. So somehow the rest of the time, you tend to actually be quite a long way away from p. So you tend to get big things like 39 at 29, or small things like 7 at 13. 
OK, so Gauss didn't prove this. I think this wasn't proved until the 1940s, but this is now completely known. So now I want to, in the last sort of two minutes or so of talking, I want to fast forward sort of through the last 70 years or so and just say, let's, let's write down a different elliptic curve and play the same game. I'm not going to do that, don't worry. But if you write down a different curve, maybe something like x plus, plus a Google or something, and you can do exactly the same game, except it's going to be obviously a little more unpleasant to, to work with the arithmetic of this. But you could plot the number of solutions, like run over the first million primes or something. And this is what people did in the 1960s when they first had computers that could do this. And you find something slightly surprising. If you've just seen that graph, you find a graph that looks completely different. It looks like this. It's basically a semicircle squished slightly. And while this could have been proved, I think quite possibly could have been proved by Gauss in the 19th century, and certainly was proved in the early 20th century, this was correct for the equation we started with, the y squared equals x cubed minus x. This is what's called the Sarto-Tate conjecture. Or it was called the sarto I guess it still is, but it's now a theorem. So, so this was formulated by Sarto and Tate in the 1960s on the basis of some theoretical evidence, but also a lot of computer calculations. It really was some of the first times that people could really compute you know, the, some, something over the first million primes or something. And they found that this looked exactly like a semicircle. But no one had much of an idea how to prove this, except there was a, a great suggestion by a very famous mathematician called Langlands, who had something called the Langlands program, which is some very general uh, conjectures in number theory. And he explained how, how this would be a consequence of these. And then in 2006, uh, Cazell, Harrison, Taylor, and Shepard Barron managed to show enough about this, this Langlands program to, to prove this conjecture. So they proved that somehow it's the case that most elliptic curves have this kind of picture, and they were able to really prove that that was the case. OK, so that still has nothing to do with me. Um, and I'm supposed to say something about something I've done. So what I should say is that their work is extremely nice, but they, they fitted it into some, some more general framework, whereas this, is, this was some conjecture about elliptic curves. They, uh, they kind of fitted it into a, into a more general picture where they formulated it maybe for what are called Hilbert modular forms, which I'm going to say nothing about. Um, but the sort of natural place to state the conjecture was perhaps in this setting, but they were only able to prove enough about it. They, they used these kind of objects, but only proved enough cases to sort of do the original elliptic curves. And then uh, I guess it was in 2009 with um, Tom Barnett Lamb and David Geraghty, I was able to prove this kind of conjecture in its, its sort of natural setting and uh, get lots of pictures like this. Uh, so I think I'll stop there. <laughs>